And now I'd like to call the president of the University of Guam, Dr. Kreis, for his convocation address. Buenas and half a day, todos hamsu, and welcome to the Fanat Sanan semester for 2019. I'm so happy to see everybody and to feel the energy. It took us 15 minutes to get to, to corral ourselves, which is a really good sign. Uh, it's also delightful to have uh, two members of the Board of Regents uh, with us, um, uh, Mari Flora Herrero and also Mebrick um, Navasaga. And uh, we were all, actually all of us were um, at the uh, governor's office yesterday for the swearing in for Father Francis Easel, who's our newest member of the board. And uh, Mebrick was uh, sworn in last week by Elvin Chang of the Board of Regents. So we have uh, um, uh, two, two uh, very recent new members. Um, and I just wanted to uh, emphasize the, how important the Board of Regents is to the University of Guam, and especially the measure of independence that uh, the board has from the political system. And ever since what I refer to as the revolution of 2001, uh, when we also created the Faculty Senate, uh, we, the, one of the key elements of that uh, revolution was the Regent Nominating Commission. And so what this does, as you probably all know, but maybe the new members don't know, uh, this commission chooses three well-qualified candidates for every open seat in the regions, and then the governor uh, appoints, is limited to appointing one of those three. So that helps to take the university out of the more direct uh, political appointments and so on. And so that's been really important to the, uh, the growth and development and success of the university um, over these, uh, push we're pushing 20 years of that. And um, so uh, just general appreciation for the Board of Regents and the work they do. And I'd like to uh, start this presentation, though, on a somber note to remember three members of our university community uh, who passed away since we last met uh, in this room last August. Um, so, and I'll ask for a moment of silence for um, Angel Petros of the RFK Library IT staff who passed away last September, Dr. Kerry Perez of the School of Business and Public Administration uh, who passed away in January, and Dr. Joe Rouse of the, of the Water and Environmental Research Institute faculty who passed away this month. So a moment of silence, please, in their memory. We'll, uh, the OG will be hosting a memorial service for Dr. Joe Rouse this Friday, uh, August 23rd, uh, from 3 to 4 p.m. here in the class lecture hall. A key part of the new energy that's flowing through our campus is our new faculty, and we'll be having them uh, um, announced individually by their deans, but I just wanted to have anybody who's new, completely new, or in a new role um, as new faculty at UOG, would you mind uh, just standing now so we can uh, recognize you and welcome you to uh, the uh, faculty assembly. Thank you very much. And this month marks uh, my own first anniversary at UOG, and I've been asked by lots of people around, uh, uh, all around, uh, questions of, uh, such as, what do you think of UOG so far, or what's special, what do you find that's special about UOG? And so I thought I'd give you some of the answers to those questions. Um, I'd like to emphasize, and I said this to the new faculty orientation yesterday, um, and I say it as often as I can, that uh, UOG is the only uh, American public university that is directed by its sponsoring government to serve people outside the jurisdiction of that government. And I think that's a really interesting distinction for us and uh, calls us to a different kind of stewardship uh, of our communities. And so uh, the fact that in our charter we are directed to serve all the people of Micronesia is a really interesting distinction. Uh, we're also, of course, as you all know, the only university in an immense region of 2.9 million square miles and over half a million people. Uh, we are also remarkable for the teaching and research that we do in areas of uh, special interest to our location, especially. And so uh, 
you know, some of the, 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 uh, the elements that are particularly notable, but not a comprehensive list, include the uh, Marine Lab, the Water and Environmental Research Institute, the Cancer Research Center, the Center for Island Sustainability, the Micronesian Area Research Center, the Western Pacific Tropical Research Center, the Center for Excellence in Development Disabilities Research, as well as a host of uh, research centers and programs and initiatives under the schools and colleges and throughout the university. So just rattling those off for uh, different communities is useful for people just to realize the complexity and richness of this university. I think sometimes people are surprised by that. And because we are the only university in this huge region, we enjoy a unique relationship with Guam and the community. And so I really do detect tremendous appreciation for the work of this faculty and the work of the university. I, I really detect uh, affection and love for this institution that I compare to my previous experience in other uh, universities, and there's really nothing like it. Um, so even among people who are not alums, there is this love and affection for this institution. So that really is something to, to notice and to appreciate uh, for all of us uh, working at the University of Guam. Um, we also have a rich array, of course, as you know, bachelor's and master's degree programs, as well as certificate and training programs from the English Adventure program all the way up to uh, corporate training and other kinds of things that we do beyond degree programs. In addition to performing all the roles of a first-class comprehensive university, we have made great strides in figuring out how to be more supportive of our students, including culturally sensitive mentoring and advisement noticing that our students are, on, uh, on the whole, more reluctant than many others in other parts of the world to seek out help from professors. And so, uh, and they tend to prefer peer mentors uh, or people closer in, uh, to their age. So I regularly tell students particularly, and said to the, to the Merit Scholars recently and a couple of other new student uh, programs, that they should really seek out the writing center, the math lab, um, they should get advisement help from the TRIO programs and others in EMSS. They should go see you uh, in your office hour, even though there's a reluctance to do so. So I encourage them, and I think we should all be encouraging people to do that, uh, because you should do that anyway, but uh, particularly in a culture where there's a, there's a resistance to doing it. So I appreciate all of your help in making that uh, happen. I think there's been a lot of attention this past year on improving that. And I think um, another reason that not just the sort of cultural sensitivity, but we also have 47% of our students are Pell eligible, eligible for the Pell Grant, which is an indication of relative financial need. And so that adds complexity to uh, student success. It, it, it adds um, impediments to student success. So helping to overcome that is really important. It's also worth noting that a majority of our students are first generation, first in their families to attend college. And what I'd like to say about that is that they, that means that they don't have 18 years worth of uh, family dinners and lunches and, and outings and just conversations with people who've been to college, know what it's like to choose a major, know what it's like to try to connect what they do in college to what they're going to do after college. So, so I say that we, we need to, in our institution, fill in for that Thanksgiving table, as I think of it. So we need to fill in for that uh, support network for so many of our students who are first in their families to go to college. So thanks to everybody in this room for doing that, for being uh, aware of the cultural sensitivities and the kinds of uh, situations that our students are in. So, you know, many are, are older, and so it's coming back to a, to a college environment with a lot of younger people can be an impediment. Many have young children, or uh, they're working uh, a job or multiple jobs to try to make, the, uh, ends, uh, make ends meet. And so thank you for all of that kind of extra mentorship that goes into uh, the work we do here. And now I'd like to just give you a little um, touch of uh, uh, update on the strategic planning process, which is named, the strategic plan is named Parahulo, which is the, um, is the tomorrow term for our Latin motto of Excelsior, so ever upward is the idea. And so building on the Good to Great program and the previous uh, strategic plan from 2010, um, the Parahulo is meant to uh, be aiming us ever upward. I'll be hosting a second town hall, so you might remember I hosted one in April to give you an update on the, the first uh, phase of the um, strategic planning process. I'll host a second one on Friday, September 6th uh, at 2 p.m., and I think it'll be in the, in the theater, but stay tuned for the location. And so I'll give a more detailed uh, 
description of the work of the Strategic Planning Committee so far, but I just wanted to give you a couple of little um, uh, tastes of it at this uh, presentation. And then we'll also be sharing our work with you uh, by email, so you'll have both. But if you can attend the town hall, there'll be that opportunity, but you have other opportunities as well. Um, so this work has been carried out in three phases, uh, beginning in January of this year. And thanks to all the members of the strategic planning committees, we had uh, a sort of a, a group that worked in the spring, then we had a slightly different group uh, working uh, in, the, in the summer so far, and then we'll be carrying on into the fall here. Um, and so thanks to all of those people, and particularly uh, our senior vice president, Dr. Anita Enriquez, and our vice president for administration and finance, Randy Wiegand, all the members of the President's Council who are part of that process, as well as faculty, staff, and student members of the committee. And um, so the first thing I wanted to, to let you know is that there's been a lot of work done in this year to finish up the items on the good to great uh, plan. So well over 200 to-do items on that list uh, have been uh, sort of finished off and tidied up. And so that's, uh, uh, I wanted to emphasize that we have paid attention to the work that this group of people and, uh, and predecessors have put into um, all kinds of planning and white papers and reports and analyses and so on. So that's been part of this uh, conversation. So the work of the Good to Great program and the collaboratoriums was all taken into consideration. Uh, and we've also nearly finished the university policy manual, which is uh, the work of bringing this together into a single replacement for the RRPM um, has done has been good for us just for clearing up uh, procedures and you know clarifying contradictory policies and so on. So uh, we expect to present that to the Board of Regents at the November meeting. And so the, uh, that's been a tremendous effort that's been going on in addition to the strategic planning process. Um, and as I mentioned in the convocation in January, the Parahulu Plan aims to move us in two principal directions. And I describe those as uh, generally labeled research, and the other one is generally labeled partnerships. And by research, I mean that UOG should continue its growth and development in the direction of becoming known, better known, as a research university, which will mean developing professional and applied doctoral programs, and then research doctorates when we're ready for that step. And uh, I think uh, part of this process is to acknowledge the work that's been done by this room full of people and our colleagues across campus. So the organization of the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs, as well as the creation of the Research Corporation of UOG, have helped to make uh, the, the research capacity of this institution much, much higher. And, and the, the, the level of funding that we're getting, it's now $14.6 million um, in research and sponsored programs. That level of funding is, is a really distinguished big figure, and we should acknowledge that and realize that we're punching well above our weight. That's a very significant figure for an institution of our size. In 2017, by comparison, so two years ago, we had 8.8 .8 million, um, and we were, li we were number 337 out of 902 institutions on the research uh, list for the United States. So we were um, the 62nd percentile uh, in, in 2017. Um, and so our, our new higher figure will put us somewhere, they haven't come out with the rankings yet, but uh, if everybody else stayed the same, we'd be at the, from 337th up to 300th, and we'd be in the company of Central Michigan University and Bowling Green State University. Both of those are well over 20,000 students, so we're about 3,700. Um, so that's really distinguished. Um, and some recent, uh, uh, figures just uh, that have come across my desk, of course, are the 3.7 million uh, HRSA grant from the School of Health. Uh, I've also seen that CEDARS is now a cumulative grant over a quarter century of $143 million. Uh, we are 14.6 million in total grants for this year are spread over 214 grants. Uh, and as Mari Flor Herrero pointed out, uh, behind every one of those projects is a tremendous amount of energy, of writing, of late night work to, to make that happen. So, um, and also as one of the subcommittees of the of the Parahulo plan, we have a group that's um, uh, focused on uh, research innovation uh, work. And so uh, that uh, some of the things that, that were either are happening or are part of the planning for that in this category include um, water testing by Weary, 
uh, which uh, the new capacity of Weary to test all uh, types of issues um, in water testing uh, is advancing their ability to raise funds and revenue and also providing more service to, the, um, to Guam and the region. Uh, the CIS, the Center for Island Sustainability's Green Growth Initiative, Guam Green Growth Initiative, G3, um, has also been included in this kind of thinking. We're, uh, we're applying to elevate our C grant uh, status to become an institutional C grant. There's interest in applying to become a, a space grant institution. And then there's interest in developing maker spaces and business incubator capacity, sort of a research park idea, uh, which would complement some of our efforts to try to develop public-private partnerships. And then, uh, as many people in the room know, we've uh, applied for new higher level funding for EPSCOR. And EPSCOR is designed to expand an institution's capacity for research beyond their core areas. So we have you know, very distinguished, high level research going on in certain core areas. And the idea of EPSCOR is to spread that capacity to more disciplines around the university. So that's just a little overview of on the research uh, component and thinking about the ways that the institution can uh, become better recognized and develop more capacity for uh, the research direction. The other direction that I mentioned is partnerships. And by that I mean that UOG should continue its growth and development in the land grant tradition and seek to be known as the leading partnership institution in Guam and all of Micronesia. And by that I mean that UOG should be able, should be uh, thought of as the first place people think of when they want to make a partnership and make some positive thing happen. Um, and so strong opportunities for this already exist for, uh, particularly for our students in terms of internships. So part of the partnership is developing uh, partnerships with companies and organizations of the government and others uh, to sponsor our students for internships, uh, provide opportunities for undergraduate research, community-based learning and service learning opportunities. Uh, learning communities is another uh, opportunity for partnerships. And also study away. I think there's great opportunity to advance study away. It's a fairly limited numbers that we have now. And I've been stressing the idea that we think about developing special capacity for study away among fellow small island communities, that our students would benefit from getting to know other small island, relatively small island uh, uh, communities, um, and that specialize, not to the exclusion of others, but to try to think of that as something of a specialty. And a key feature, I think, of our becoming a more robust partnership institution will be creating stronger connections with our regional colleges. So Guam Community College, Northern Marianas College, the Lao Community College, the College of Micronesia, FSM, and the College of the, Mi of the Marshall Islands. And so, so a couple of examples of the partnerships there are uh, a group of us were very, very well received in Saipan uh, in May when we launched the 3 plus 1 program in criminal justice. So thanks to many people in this room for making that possible. The enthusiasm was really quite overwhelming to all of us. We were just really uh, impressed. Uh, and we, we sort of thought that part of the reason for the enthusiasm is their, their gratitude for the, the help that Guam and UOG provided uh, in the wake of, of, the, um, of the Typhoon U2. Um, but it really, really well received. And this presents a model then that we could expand to other programs that we do with NMC, and then NMC can serve as a model for our relationship with other uh, places. Uh, we've also uh, done a lot of work with uh, reaching out to our alumni. We had a very uh, particularly large and, and successful alumni gathering in Washington, D.C. We included not only our alumni, but also the members of the Guam Society of D.C. And so people uh, came who were not necessarily alums, but also people who really um, uh, attached to Guam. So that's another. And we've been doing a number of uh, programs around uh, particularly in Guam, but we've also done in the region, and, and going from company to company or organization to organization, gathering our alumni. And that's been really effective for helping people to sort of see each other as uh, alums. It's been nice for the bosses, who are often alums, <laughs> to see who, who their graduates are. So that's been very successful. And I also mentioned, uh, in terms of partnership, uh, Wary's water testing is a great example of partnership because it's providing a direct service. It's related to our research capacity. It presents opportunities for doing uh, service for our community. And then uh, I think another aspect of partnership is, is advancing our student outcomes in lots of different ways. And so we've had uh, a number of successes lately, including um, an NSF scholarship and a Truman scholarship. 
Uh, we've had uh, people going on to graduate programs at very distinguished, pro uh, very distinguished institutions, and so all of that uh, redounds to our um, excellence at, at preparing our students for what comes next. And then um, we've also been, uh, the Student Government Association and EMSS have done a lot to uh, develop more programs for student life activities on campus. So two new things this past year include the Veterans Day uh, ceremony and recognition, and also the Tritons Out Loud uh, program, which uh, is uh, now both of those intend to become annual events. And then we've also improved our graduation rate to at least 38%. There are two different ways to calculate it. One of them is 38%, the other is 40%. So that's great direction. We need to continue to move in that direction. Um, and so uh, thanks to everybody here for helping make that possible. Um, and on the strategic plan, I think uh, a couple of things that are worth noting is that we're in the process of figuring out the action plan, we're tracking uh, how well each thing that we do do connects to certain kinds of outcomes that we care about. So um, everybody's probably aware of high impact educational practices, and so we've been tracking those for a number of years, and we'll continue to track those in the plan. We're also tying our institutional learning objectives, which are very important to our accreditation process, uh, to, to pay attention to those in the um, in the plan. And then there's a group of 17 um, sustainable development goals developed by the United Nations, and so we're tracking the way that our institution can be uh, helping to serve those uh, interests of those 17 sustainable development goals. And uh, in the category of discussing both the, the um, research and partnership aspect of the plan, uh, uh, I think the, the goal should be that we move up on the uh, Carnegie classification of institutions. So at the moment, we're a regional comprehensive institution with a range of, of uh, master's degrees and a large array of bachelor's degrees. The next sort of status level up is now labeled a doctoral professional university by Carnegie. And so uh, in moving in this direction, we have to keep our focus on our primary mission of teaching and of undergraduate teaching. So the teaching and learning mission has to be front and center throughout this process. And that on top of that, we then build our capacity to offer professional doctorates and eventually research PhDs. We should extend the research capacity to a wider array of disciplines. As I mentioned, the F score is designed to help us do that. And uh, also to develop more capacity for undergraduate research. So that would serve two purposes uh, of, of supporting our students' outcomes as well as expanding our capacity for research. And then there'll be work done in the next five years in terms of personnel policies, uh, the union contract, promotion and tenure policies, and so on, to ad adjust our institution to be ready for uh, this higher level of institution. And one way to, uh, to sort of guide us or to give us a map to follow in this process would be to, uh, to aim for a reclassification of the university as a doctoral professional university. That's the bottom of the old research two, if you understand those terms, research one and research two. It used to be called a research three. It's been through many name changes. Um, so having that classification, uh, which it, it's a number of years before we can apply for that, but looking at what it takes to do that would provide us with a nice map for achieving that goal. And then on the partnership uh, level, I think thinking more clearly of ourselves as Micronesia's university is really serving this whole region, I think will help us to, to think about our role as a partnership, uh, the leading partnership institution in this region. And then also I think thinking of ourselves, if we are Micronesia's university, how are we connecting ourselves to other parts, particularly of the Pacific? So how are we connecting to the Commonwealth Pacific, to the EU Pacific, to uh, other parts of, of this region, um, and, uh, and how are we, we serving that, uh, the principle of the partnership. So I, I think of some of that as erasing the dotted lines in the water, um, including reaching out to Kiribati and Nauru, which are sort of, they're Micronesia, but there's a dotted line in the water there. So I think of thinking about those and reaching out to other institutions, like the University of the South Pacific, the University of French Polynesia, uh, Fiji National University, and others in the, in the region. So um, the idea of expanding our, uh, in our partnership, one of the ways that we can do that is another Carnegie classification. It's a voluntary one uh, for community engagement. 
And so that too is uh, a number of years in the future that we would uh, be eligible to apply for it. But it provides a nice roadmap of the kinds of programs, uh, service learning, community-based learning, undergraduate research, all the kinds of things that I've mentioned um, that, that you need to do in order to qualify for that. So that gives us two uh, classifications that we can aim for that will help us um, uh, figure out how to reach those goals. And as we press in these two directions of research and partnerships, I think it's important to think about all the ways that we serve our island and our region. And especially, um, I, I think it's, it's worth contemplating how we address the two big economic engines of, uh, of Guam particularly, which is uh, tourism and government spending, particularly focused on defense. And then I think it's also important that we think very creatively about how we support creative arts, culture, languages better than, than we do. So the ways that that is a critical part of our partnership. And then I think it's also important for us to think of ourselves as a model for other agencies of the government of Guam. So in our processes, our customer service, uh, our efficiency, those would be another way. That, uh, thinking of ourselves as a model uh, for others to emulate is a, is a good way to think about um, our future. And then, uh, as you know, we have a continuing challenge in funding uh, from uh, public support for higher education. We're not alone in that in the, in the country. You might all have paid attention to the drama in Alaska recently. Um, and so uh, there, there are many, uh, one of our challenges as an institution is we're doing extraordinarily good work and it's hard to go before the legislature and ask for funding when you look like things are going, you know, are very, very well. And so um, we've done lots of, uh, lots of effort by many people in this room to try to emphasize what's happened over the past uh, four years. And so, um, uh, or, or at least four. It's the last time that we've received both uh, a full appropriation and an allotment was in 2015. And so you see there with the uh, 15, 16, 17, and 18, a decline in um, mainly in the allotments, which is the amount of money that the executive branch delivers to the university. The appropriation is what the legislature votes to uh, grant the institution. And so we're having problems in both of those. Um, and so it's, uh, it's important that we all think about the ways that we're connected. This room is very, very well connected uh, with uh, the political structure and the community. And we need to support for the institution from everybody. We need everybody to recognize how important this institution is. And so the fact that about a third of our funding comes from the appropriation um, makes people think that we can just tap all this other money, uh, endowment and research funding and so on, and they don't understand that all of those funds are very specifically designated for certain things and that we can't just reach into a bag of coins and dump it into uh, the basic operations of the institution. And so, um, so thinking of all the ways that we can, can e emphasize the value of this institution um, and to uh, encourage our representatives to, um, to uh, support us. So um, this is the, there are two committees that are particularly important to the uh, university, the Committee on General Government Operations, Appropriations, and Housing, uh, chaired by uh, Senator Joe San Augustine. Um, and there's a list of the members and so on. Um, so that you know who those are. The other committee, there's a lot of overlap between the two committees, and the second one is the Committee on Higher Education and the Advancement of Women, Youth, and Senior Citizens, chaired by Senator Amanda Shelton. And so um, I think it's important that we convey in all the ways that we can uh, the importance of the institution and the importance of the funding of the institution. So I thank you for your help in that. Um, we're, we're doing as many different ways as we can, but we need your help too in making that possible. So I'd like to just um, con uh, conclude with um, uh, thanks to you all. The faculty are the reason that everybody's here. There, there's no university without the faculty. The students wouldn't come for anybody else. So we're very, very glad uh, to have this extraordinary faculty uh, to, to uh, advance our mission in all the ways that, that we have. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize our interest in shared governance. And I think particularly since that revolution of 2001, uh, the, the processes that we have in place at this institution to advance shared governance are particularly effective. And I'm, I appreciate all of the work that goes in to making that work. And um, I also I wanted to thank you for continually improving your teaching and mentoring, research and service to our students, to the university, 
to Guam and to all of Micronesia, and well, as well as beyond here, professional associations and to uh, connections that we have uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. So let's all look forward to a rich and interesting upcoming academic year. So ever upward, para hulo, and biba uog. Thank <laughs> you.